name is Kevin Papp, K-E-V-I-N-P-A-A-P, -A -A County Commissioner. You know, as a kid who rode the school bus across that dam and up the gravel road, hopefully up depending on what the winter weather was like, or as a County Commissioner representing this area, it's hard to believe we'd be here with this in our background. You know, as a child, as parents with kids, as grandparents with grandchildren, um, this area, the dam store, the burgers and malts, the pies, and the walk out to the dam provided many special memories, not only for our family, but many others. Not only from this community and this county, but from all over the state and well beyond. Seeing this today puts a hole in many of our hearts. Our thoughts and prayers are to the Hruska family and friends through this difficult and overwhelming time. Uh, before introducing Governor Waltz, I really need to remember my manners and say thank you. On behalf of the Blue Earth County Commissioners here today, thank you to the Rushka family for the special memories. Thank you to Blue Earth County staff, those on site and those going beyond to cover in other parts of the county. I do have to single out four groups, our administration leadership, public works, emergency management, and the sheriff's office. Thank you for your hours and hours of work. We want to thank the federal, state, other county and local agencies for their assistance. And I want to shout out or call out specifically the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, Minnesota Department of Transportation Bridge Safety Staff, and Minnesota DNR Dam Safety Staff. I want to thank our state, national, and other county officials, XL Energy. Thank you to the contractors who dropped everything, uh, the projects they were on, to get here on time. And I want to thank the media. You know, the media, you are key to getting out timely, accurate information. I also would like to thank the citizens who respected the safety boundaries. You know, everyone is working extremely hard to focus on safety while managing a very difficult situation. About 6.55 Monday morning is when I got the first text and most of them were all about the same. What can I do to help? And appreciate all the reach out from the elected officials. Shortly uh, we got a chance to communicate with the governor directly and appreciate that. I want to thank him for his time checking it out by air, but especially checking it out today with boots on the ground. So it is my honor as chair of Blue Earth County Commissioners to introduce Governor Waltz. Governor? Well, yeah, thank you to thank you to Commissioner Papp and Kevin and to the rest of the commissioners who are here, the state representatives and senators. Uh, look, uh, I think all of you know this. The, these are folks that were my neighbors, literally. We went to, our kids went to school together. I've known them. I've leaned on these folks uh, with great experience on what needs to be done. Uh, and, and to the Haruska family, I, I think they're hearing it. They're, they're dealing with it in themselves. Where is your home, your business, and all that? Uh, the community feels the loss because this family built something here with Jim that, that you know communities are lucky if they have a place like this. Um, it was a gathering place with Blake Book talked about. I like Kevin. I didn't ride the school bus across this, but I rode my bike too damn fast down this trail, many, on this highway many times. Um, it's a big part of the community. And I, I told the family one of the things was is amongst all they were dealing with is uh, their symptom of optimism and gratitude and grace they showed in interviews at a time of great turmoil lifted up a lot of people. I was getting calls from uh, around the world asking about this dam of folks who knew I lived in this neighborhood and they, they talked about that sense of community. Uh, I will echo Kevin's thanks to everybody involved in this, the emergency managers, the, the sheriff and, and the deputies that are here. Uh, I know for a fact, because I've been in there, many of them ate here many times. We've all been down here. They're part of the community. I think many times when we see our first responders, um, we see such great service out of them because it's our neighbors and, and they're there to do that. So first and foremost, in an emergency like this, it's protecting life of people around and, and pitching in as neighbors. And then the system kicks in. And you're going to hear from the emergency managers. You're going to hear from the engineers. You're going to hear from MnDOT people. All of those things are in part of a standard operating procedure that works its way up. And I can't give enough thanks to the folks protecting folks, making good decisions, stabilizing the situation, and then simultaneously start thinking about 
what does recovery look like? I'm pleased that uh, Blue Earth County was named in one of the first counties that received the federal and presidential disaster declaration. I think most folks by now know what that means, 75% reimbursement from the federal government. Our tax dollars that we paid, and when Hurricane Katrina hits, we were glad to help them. When other things happen, that happens. So that money will come back to Minnesota. I want to thank the legislators on several fronts. Minnesota is one state that already built it into our system that the 25% match can come from the state, meaning that with the federal declaration, we get 100% reimbursement. And then the legislators standing behind us did something, again, that other governors, when they talk to me, are trying to talk their legislators into doing. We have a disaster assistance contingency account. It's got about $26.4 million in it now. Because of the last legislative session, it will replenish in August, $50 million more in that. That fund can be used without a federal declaration, and it can be used if a county or if a township or if a community didn't reach the thresholds to warrant that reimbursement we can reimburse 75% of that out of that account. So the one thing I think Minnesotans should be reassured about, we will, we will rebuild. Uh, the cost will be shared by all of us, so the burden will not fall on these county commissioners. But I think what we need to think about, the lost business that's here, and I think one of the concerns that, was, uh, that we've seen, and I think Ryan will talk to you a little bit about, is very important bridge that we see here, about uh, 40 years old, but I think the concern is that it is going to be structurally damaged by this and will need to be replaced. And then I think you start wrapping your mind around what that's going to look like. I ask those folks who live out here, it's 15 minutes every day. Um, that, that's a lot uh, to ask for folks if it's 15 minutes every trip around this thing. So those are things we'll know in the coming days. There'll be more assessments going. The counties that have not yet been included in the disaster declaration does not mean they're not going to be. It means that the damage assessments are still coming in and being resubmitted. So this will be on a rolling basis where counties will be added. Once they're added, we will move forward. And uh, again, uh, just deep gratitude to all the folks who responded to this, uh, a thankfulness that we haven't had any fatalities. I will mention we had one in western Wisconsin this morning of, of someone in the rushing river we lost, it looks like. I'm gonna reiterate to everyone, uh, be very careful. Water is still dangerous. And again, not driving around any of these barricades. With that, I'll give it to the person who's responsible for making sure those types of things happen. Uh, DPS Commissioner Cunning, or, uh, Jacobson can join us. Thank you, Governor. Hello, I'm Bob Jacobson. I'm the Commissioner of Public Safety for the state of Minnesota. It's an honor to serve in that capacity. First of all, I want to thank Governor Waltz, our FEMA partners, and all the state agencies that have remained working diligently by our side through this disaster. As a reminder, we're still working under the governor's peacetime emergency. What that means is that state agencies are still able to get out there to assist um, our local uh, governments whether it be local or county governments with any assistance that they may need, whether it be equipment or materials. National Guard is still available under that peacetime emergency to respond if needed. Uh, if there are resources or personnel that are needed in any flood areas, they are still ready uh, and able to respond. We've had as many as 50 National Guardsmen out at any one time to be able to help. Our State Emergency Operations Center is still active. So again, we're taking any incoming requests for resources and needs. This disaster is not over. We are still here, we're still working, we're still serving the state of Minnesota and those that are out there who need our assistance. As the governor mentioned, many of you, uh, you may have heard, 22 counties were approved for a presidential declaration. Uh, I'll reemphasize what the governor mentioned. That does not mean that if you're a county that was impacted, that does not mean that you are not gonna get a presidential declaration. As many of you are aware, flooding is still going down in many areas to get a full damage assessment of those areas. We need those flood waters to be able to go down to be able to do that. Right now we're aware of a total of 47 counties in the state of Minnesota, 47, um, that have been impacted by floods. Um, so we'll continue working on that. Uh, we are also continuing to work with FEMA. Our partners have been in town. The regional administrator from Region 5 was in town for several days last week. We're uh, continuing to work with them on the potential for an individual assistance. Uh, so that as uh, we tally up damage assessments that may be uh, coming in from around the state of Minnesota, uh, remember that homeowners and business owners may be eligible uh, for individual, assess or individual assistance as this, uh, as this recovery process goes along. We're not at that point yet, but for homeowners and business owners that are out here and that are listening, 
please take pictures, take photographs, all that you can of any damage that you may have suffered at your home or your business. If you have repaired anything, make sure and keep those receipts. Those are going to be very important for you to be able to share with your local emergency management officials and FEMA when the time comes to be able to qualify for individual assistance through the FEMA process. So we are working diligently with that. Uh, also, uh, just a, a last message again, the governor mentioned this too, but to reemphasize, remember safety. We are still uh, in the midst of, uh, of floods. We don't want anyone to be hurt or injured. We are very fortunate uh, for a flood and a disaster this size that we have not lost a life. We don't want to start that now. So please, uh, please be safe as you're around floodwaters. Uh, be careful. Spend time with your families, talking to them about safety messages so that uh, we don't see anyone get hurt. We still have, um, it's been proven now, uh, as we all know, that Minnesota weather um, can be unpredictable and can be very dangerous. So again, reminders to take care, pay attention to safety. Uh, and then I also want to remind uh, everybody that we can rebuild. Um, we can't recover perhaps from lost lives, but we will have the ability to recover from this. Minnesotans are resilient. This community is resilient. The folks that I've met here with are resilient. I am terribly impressed with this community and how they've come together and will continue to do so. We from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety will be there alongside of you through this entire process. We are not here today and gone tomorrow. We will be here. We will be a part of this recovery process. We'll be a resource for all of you. And then finally, I want to especially thank our local emergency managers who have been very key in this recovery process, uh, making sure that they are coordinating resources. I also want to make sure that um, our government and elected officials who are here have been tremendous to work with. They are there on behalf of their communities, doing the best that they can to help serve and bring us back. Um, the volunteers, the generosity and time given by volunteers who may not even necessarily know our flood victims, um, watching that through this whole process has been inspiring. And so thank you to all those who have spent that time to volunteer to do that work on behalf of their fellow community members. We can't be more thankful. And then lastly, to the emergency responders who have been here throughout this, who responded, who will be part of the recovery. They're part of the fabric of your community. My thanks to all those who've been able to respond and will be a part of your community. They'll be a part of helping you through this. And again, uh, and my thanks to all of you and appreciate having the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Tilgis. I'm the Blue Earth County Highway Engineer and Public Works Director. I'm here to talk about the condition of the bridge. First and foremost, though, I would like to thank the governor, uh, as well as our state representatives and our, our members of our federal delegation as well for their attendance today. And as Commissioner Papp stated early, earlier during his speech, uh, we've been very fortunate to have had a tremendous level of assistance at both the state, federal, and local level. So it's been uh, phenomenal to have seen that and have had the support. The County Public Works Department has been in uh, kind of constant contact with members from the Army Corps of Engineers, with members from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, as well as the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Currently, the county is very concerned about the condition of the bridge. The bridge piers are constructed on top of sandstone bedrock, and effectively that the, the bridge pier piling aren't driven down into the bedrock, they're just driven down so that the ends are sitting on top of the bedrock, and all of the lateral stability for the piling was achieved through the sediment that was in place that had been impounded in the river basin over the life of the dam. Uh, so as we're seeing dramatic levels of river head cutting as the river's lowering itself down and washing away tremendous amounts of sediment, uh, we're losing stability. So the county did uh, activate an emergency operation Friday to tr attempt to stabilize the very western pier number one. We were able to get some large rock riprap through a construction access road that was constructed by a local contractor who was already working for the county about 10 miles away. They were able to protect and stabilize pier number one. However, during conversations with MnDOT and with the Corps of Engineers, it was not recommended that we, due to safety concerns and due to other adverse impacts that could happen, that we attempt to build a causeway across the river and stabilize pier number two. Uh, with that being said, We've had several calls with the Corps and with MINDA trying to evaluate other options to try to protect Pier Number 2. Right now, we believe that 
effectively half of the length of the pile. Piling are, are wide open, taking loading from the water, and they're unprotected. And effectively, if it goes too much farther, we're going to be concerned that it's going to be too much instability or not enough lateral support for those piling. So we're closely monitoring it. We did attempt to do some underwater surveying using a, a LIDAR unit last night. However, we were unsuccessful due to the turbidity, that meaning the water has too much air moving through the water. The water's turning over too much and there's too much sediment in the water for them to be able to get an accurate reading. So we weren't able to get data. The water is flowing too fast for us to do our conventional measures, which would be a weighted rope and trying to attempt to take scour measurements at the river or at the pier. Right now, again, we believe it's approximately 50% exposed. And as the river level continues to decrease and cut the riverbed elevation down, uh, we're very concerned about the potential for partial or full failure of the bridge. With that being said, the bridge has been closed since the dam began to overtop Monday morning, and we'll continue to keep it closed for public safety. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Time for two on-topic questions. Let's go. Okay, sure. If you got any of them, we've got elected officials back here. We've got other county commissioners. We have the experts here, but anything you need. What can you say more about whether the bridge or the dam, the extent to which this situation could have been sort of uh, prevented with mitigation measures earlier? How much of this is due to the weather? I'll maybe let Ryan. We were just discussing that about the ability to move some of the. So the bridge was being monitored uh, routinely. In fact, Sunday afternoon, we were, I was personally out here looking at the bridge. There was a the large mass that you see on the right side of the dam, the probably 15 to 20 foot thick conglomerate of trees that's almost 50 feet wide was hung up on the upstream bridge pier. We don't have equipment or capability of getting that large of a mass of trees off of the river, especially when the river's passing. Uh, at the time, it was almost 24,000 cubic feet per second. When we came back out Sunday night about 9 p.m., 9 to 9.30 p.m., the river was passing 26,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, we actually, Sunday afternoon, reached out to an area contractor who has historically done removals, and we can't pick the trees up and flip them and throw them over the top of the dam. They're too waterlogged, they're too heavy, and it's not safe. We have to actually turn them, push them down, and push them through the gates. It's very dangerous work, and it requires special equipment with a special, a special excavator that sits out on the bridge deck with a special bucket on the excavator. The contractor who's done this work, who's one of the few who would ever even be willing to do the work, that piece of equipment was five hours away, and that contractor stated that due to the flow rates, he would not feel safe being out on the bridge deck with those flow rates. It was, it was unsafe for him and for the lives of their operators. Um, so with that being said, we evaluated that later on. Tuesday, we were in contact with six different contractors after the water stopped overtopping the dam. Nobody was willing to send out their, their operator and their piece of equipment and risk their operator's life to try to push those trees through. And at that point, there was, there was a massive spike of trees that came down the river um, between 9.30 p.m. on Sunday night and 1.30 a.m. Monday morning when we were notified of the dam overtopping. Uh, we, it's, a, it's a product of drought that's happened over the last three to four years with a tremendous river basin upstream of the dam. We, we have a lot of fallen and dead trees um, for miles and miles up the river. And when we had this massive flush, this, this incredible spike of runoff, uh, it, it carried them down the river very rapidly. Ryan, was there debris then in there prior to that spike of trees that could have been removed? There, there, there were a few there? trees that appeared, that, and we've seen this um, over the years with the dam where you do occasionally get a tree or two hung up in the gates, and with the flows and, and more debris, they'll, they will work their way through, generally speaking. But even just knowing that there were a few trees in two of the gates, uh, that's when our staff did call that contractor to see if we could get them out here um, to, to get it as clear as possible. And that was but prior to that? That was Sunday point. afternoon. And yeah. that, that large conglomerate broke loose sometime Sunday night. So that was not possible to get them out here? No. no. Do you see that dam being rebuilt? Or? That's not a decision that I'm at, at liberty to speak on. What damage is there? I mean, the, the, the term to partial failure of the dam, but the dam structure itself is all intact. Yes. So the terminology within the Rapid and Dam Emergency Action Plan is potential failure and imminent failure. So those are the terms in, in, in the EAP states that we need to be conservative and cautious. So we went to the highest level of threat. It's really what it, what it ended up being is a failure of the west embankment adjacent to the dam or the west abutment of the dam. The dam structure itself is still intact. In fact, the dam safety engineers from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission who are here today 
were out on the deck of the dam today earlier evaluating the safety of the dam. They didn't see any significant structural cracks to my understanding or large scour holes that would give us concern about the stability of the dam for, for the interim state. One more, no part Hannah? of the dam went away. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yep. In previous conversations with Blue Earth County, I know initially they had, when they were previously considering dam removal, um, I know that initially they were very concerned about removing the dam because of the uh, decades of sediment buildup behind the dam, um, and that initially when they were going to remove it, it, they would need to unleash the sediment very slowly. But because of the, you know, obviously of what we're seeing here right now with the rushing water, a lot of that sediment has been unleashed into the river. Um, what conversations have been had with the Minnesota DNR, and uh, is there any immediate concerns to the ecological impact downstream on the Blue Earth River? And I guess are there any um, immediate concerns right now, or like down the road, are there any plans to um, study what impact it could have on the wildlife or in the communities or living along the river banks? That's, that's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> I'll try to t answer them to the best of my ability. Yes, um, it, it was planned if we were to remove the dam under the, the study that was done by Bar Engineering in 2021 that it would be a staged release of the sediment that was impounded upstream of the dam. And a lot of the sediment, the hope was that we could actually place it on the river banks adjacent to the river as we reestablished re about three and a half miles of river channel. Um, obviously, we've lost that in an uncontrolled manner. The dam was classified as high threat because of the potential ecological impacts due to the sudden release of sediment. It was a low threat with respect to the potential for loss of life. Um, so as far as to the extents of the ecological impacts, I don't have an answer on that. I don't know who will be studying it. Um, really right now, we're, we're very concerned again about the bridge safety and trying to find interim mitigation measures. So we, again, we've been in constant conversation with the Army Corps of Engineers, the FERC, MnDOT and others, trying to see what can we do to mitigate further erosion. And I'll be perfectly honest, all the solutions we came up with had almost as bad or worse adverse impacts that could affect the dam stability farther or could result in, in damages to the bridge or additional erosion. Uh, so we've, we've had very limited success on finding a solution due to the, the rapid flow rates and the volume of water going through. Yep. Can, you explain, a little, cool. yeah, go for can it. you explain a little more, and this might be more important to the governor, but um, a little more about what relief aid will look like under this disaster declaration specifically for the county affected? Yeah, and I don't know if the commissioner, some of them, and again, with the federal declaration, as I said, is the 75% that comes into us. The state has it in, that is uh, the 25%. The DACA account is separate from that. that. We use that when we don't reach these levels or it's more localized. Uh, that will start to come in. I think one of the concerns that got asked about the folks here is the reimbursement of this and making sure. I, I just want to reassure that the county officials who are here, the city officials, um, that in a case like this, especially with a presidential declaration, the ability to make you as whole as possible is much greater. Uh, we will get there. We will rebuild it. And I think some of you are starting to think about it. Um, I, you know, I don't want to, I, I can't speculate on it, but it sure seems to me that this bridge may be one that needs to be replaced. You start to do the math on that, and that is a big, that is a big investment. That can't fall just on Blue Earth County taxpayers. That's one we'll work together. So that's the way that works. One more with the governor. Yep. Yeah. Questions for the governor. Sure. Uh, also on what recovery looks like. Um, well, you know, as floodwaters recede, um, but some people still are very affected by like the effects of the flooding. What would you say to those people for whom this uh, complicated insurance process was unlikely to make them like completely financially whole? Yeah. Well, I've I've said this many times. The flooding is the hardest one. First and foremost, you protect lives. But if you're going to have different types of, uh, of natural disasters, whether it be a tornado or a fire, you've still lost buildings. And if you don't get anybody killed, the difference is in those instances, especially with tornado, people have homeowner's insurance. The really hard one is floods take longer. It's harder to clean up. You've already lost all your personal things, so there's the emotional impact of it, and it takes a long time. So I think the biggest thing on this is is reminding people um, we need to keep talking. There is a reason that in floods we also make available uh, folks from the Department of Health. We have mental health counselors, things like that. I don't want to sugarcoat it. It's, it's tragic and it's frustrating. Um, it's going to take a while, but there are resources to help in that. And then I just think that 
this is incumbent upon us, those of us in elected office, I even say this at the federal level, a sense of urgency to get things done when they need to get done. If people need permits, get the permits. We saw this up in Cook and Bawabic last week. They had an issue where they needed to replace a gas line was hanging in the open. It didn't break. It was hanging and they were having to get a permit to move that gas line. The normal time of that is six weeks. Well, we're not going to take six weeks. They needed it that afternoon. So I think telling our agencies, we're not going to cut any safety corners or anything, but when folks need an answer, give them an answer. When folks need something done, do that. If we need to put more people on the spike like we did there to get a permit issued in a matter of hours rather than weeks, do that. So I just think um, I'm not going to tell people to be patient because they've gone through everything. I'm going to tell them to be a little bit impatient, but to understand, ask for some help call out, let people be there. And then uh, this is a case of, I know that it's happened here, neighbors helping neighbors. Um, it's one of the things in a tragedy like this, there's an outpouring in the beginning of people paying attention. And then if you weren't impacted, you go back to your daily life. The folks impasse, the Hruska family is not going back to their daily life right now. And I think it's important for all of us. And I know the folks that are here understand that, but just to keep keep this going, keep, uh, keep the interest, keep the, uh, the help and aid coming. But I think numerous so, folks will be here for other questions. Wait, thank you. Well, let me wait for these guys. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get them. You guys can have over this way. Yeah. Unless Rich wants to be in shots on off-topic questions. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, off-topic. Sure. Governor, what can you share about uh, what said about the uh, phone call among uh, the governor regarding yeah. the president's uh, performance? And then will you be in any person? Yeah, well, the, the, the call... Uh, wasn't specifically about that. I am the chair of the Democratic Governors Association, so in reference to the call yesterday, governors get together on this. The Democratic Governors Association is 23 governors representing about 180 million Americans. We get together. Nine of us were together last weekend in Minneapolis in person. Not that all unusual. We got on a call. We talked about uh, some of the things that we're doing, talking about the political races and things, and, and talking just be candidly about some of the natural disasters each of us are facing in our states, whether it be wildfires or flooding. And then talk turned a little bit to what was obviously a poor performance in last Thursday's debate, and governors uh, uh, asking questions about what, what is the plan, how are you going to do this, how are we going to message this. And, and very clearly, because especially with yesterday's Supreme Court decision, the threat seems very real that we will have a shift in how our country does business more towards a, you know, a supreme executive and one that has unlimited power versus ones where we have federalism and state governors have a lot of say in how things are done. And what I would say is, is that the conversation was about the results do matter. And I would stress it in this situation, being able to have the federal government's folks out here continuing to work is really important. So that was the conversation. Are you hoping to organize a meeting tomorrow at the White House as well? Uh, that was talked about in this, and, and uh, we will see. I have not yet heard back. We're down here doing the work on this. Uh, I uh, expect to hear some calls today that uh, I think that's a possibility. What will so, be addressed thank you. in that meeting tomorrow? I think some of just the same concerns that we talked about. Look, I, I don't think anybody sugarcoats this. I've been through this. I have, well, many of you have covered it. You know I'm a poor debater, and you've seen it happen. Um, but I think the question is, is how does that impact how the country runs? How does it impact what an election looks like? And again, it, it, it's about the differences and the, bi, you know, the, the binary choice that we're going to face in November, uh, how important that is. So I think folks just want to know and just want to ask some questions. Congressman so. Lloyd Doggett today called for the president to step down. Yeah. Any comments on that? Well, I haven't talked to him. I, I don't know what he said. I mean, that's an individual choice that each have to make. He assumed, I guess, uh, assumed that that was the case. and. Um, We'll see. I probably, I think, yeah, we'll let the, each one of those make their own decision. But we'll get you more information on this. Our focus is here to get this thing taken care of. And again, final thoughts to the people here. Thank you for your resiliency. Thank you to the family. Um, again, as I said, it, we, we shouldn't really ask this of them, but the Hruska family actually lifted up everybody else at a time when they were kind of, they were hit the hardest. Uh, that's a real gift. And, uh, and I'm appreciative of that, that their optimism helps us rebuild. So thank you all.